So we can, I have one question. Yeah, please. So Dr. Valeria, because that is the most recent talk we can remember now. So the thumb is a beautiful case you presented, harvested from the amputated foot. Uh, we did one, but we did not do like banking. So my question is, uh, why did you prefer banking in the radial artery instead of the like the people? Uh, there have been papers of in ALT pedicle or in a distant pedicle and bring it back there. Is there any particular reason for banking? Yeah, in this case, he had a very traumatized, dirty infection, right? It's in the theater of operations. So we're not going to do definitive reconstruction in Afghanistan. Our usual policy is we want to get him back to America, which usually takes three to five days before we do our next stage reconstruction. The other reason is I had generals in the field that said I could only use that injured opportunity. Otherwise, I would have banked it on the opposite side and then transferred it later because it would have been a little bit more predictable. But, you know, given the constraints of the medical theater, which are a little bit different in operational times and what I do potentially at my practice at MGH, that was part of the reason why I was banked on that particular side. Fantastic. Very nice. So, um, any other questions from the audience? If so, uh, please. A question for Jackus about uh, replantation. Do you think uh, having presented and published, it has make any difference in increasing the numbers across US or is there any new trend which you see? No, I wish my publication made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think so. I think that the you know, people people are working on like, uh, like Dr. Levin and ASSH are working on centers of excellence and working with the American College of Surgeons to have um, B plan centers. And I think that that's a fundamental thing that we are that we need. I think uh, the difference uh, we'll only see true difference once we start. Uh, setting up and using centers of excellence for replantation. Do you think one, one reason is most of the Eastern centers, the junior most person or the very young, they only do most of the replants because they are fresh and they're very good and doesn't need too much of uh, what you call a major clinical knowledge. It's only fingertip skills. I think that is one of the reasons which it uh, increases the number of replants because most of the time emergency they are being handled they are the ones who are there uh, are you are you saying in the u.s or elsewhere no i'm telling you whether in the u.s if you think the junior as as soon as they start like in japan the concept is the junior staff they start with replants first then the last they do the tenant runs was then major reconstruction so the whole thing is reversed whereas here we tend even in our hospital like we tend to keep replants to like senior surgeon. So most of the time it happens is that unless a senior person is really interested, like your classic slide is relative contraindication and relative indication. So it just changes depending on who is on call. Not only the center, the who is on call matters whether it is replanted or not in many centers across. I think that is a, well, that's very nice, very, very, very. Yeah, I think another big issue with that is that uh, it's delayed to the referring centers of excellence, right? Oftentimes, we'll see in America, especially on the East Coast, because I'm on the East Coast, these patients will end up in another ER at another facility, and transfer rates can really impact the ability in order to do a replant because of delay in transfer. And um, have, did you look at that as well, uh, Dr. Harcourt, if you've ever seen that being a factor? Because I know it is here. I've, I've seen it myself. We've tried looking at that. It's been difficult for us to get the data. We were looking at um, the state, um, the New York State Sparks data. It, it shows about um, uh, transfers and such, but we just couldn't get that uh, granularity of the data, but that would be very, very interesting. You know, one of the things that we looked at, we were, I was interested to see with the New York State database was, was there a difference in survival rate between the high, the relatively high volume centers in New York State versus the low. And interestingly, we didn't see a big difference. And then we also wanted to look at, see if there's a difference in the insurance of the patients. For example, were the patients with um, bad insurance transferred more likely than the patients with good insurance? Um, because anecdotally, I've heard that 
you know, just seeing that also in, in California, but we couldn't get that, that granularity of the data, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, here is a, a question from Jax. Uh, he asked, um, uh, sorry, as an audience have a question for Dr. Jax. Uh, well, 3D printed parts made of uh, pictures still function well if combined with a myoelectric unit. I sorry, sorry. I think it's uh, um. Hi, I'm Eugene. Uh, it's more of plastic, three D printed PVC plastic, combined with the myoelectric unit over metal parts. Would it be also a cheaper option? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. I do not claim to be an expert on prosthetics, um. So, uh, I am probably not the best one to answer that question. But from my limited experience and my very limited knowledge, I don't foresee that being a problem at all. Um, the, the, the parts being printed, um, I know prosthetists, I work a lot with, close, closely with a lot of prosthetists, and I know Dr. Valerio as well, you probably work a lot with prosthetists. I, the prosthetists don't seem to like those inexpensive 3D printed uh, prosthetics, and I'm not sure why. Um, I don't think it's just because they're getting cut out that patients aren't going to them. I think the biggest problem with the prosthetics and the 3D printed prosthetics that I get from the, prosth the prosthetists is that fitting of the prosthetic is, and, and getting the right prosthetic for the patient is the, is the main problem. It's not the prosthetic itself. And so when patients have these 3D printed prosthetics that they may be able to do on their own or, or on their own or they construct them on their own the prosthetist is highly skilled and very important in getting the right prosthetic and then making sure that it fits well because as we know especially for upper extremity prosthetics i can't remember the exact the exact data but i think it's if you don't get that patient fitted into a prosthetic in the first three months for upper extremity the likelihood that they will use a prosthetic in the future is very poor because they accommodate so quickly. So I think that's, I think that'll help with getting the, pros, the prosthetics cheaper, but you still need the prosthetist um, and that's essential. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Valeria or, or Dr. Stroll, um, any of you want to um, uh, contribute? I can comment on the, the partial hands. We do quite a few here as well. And just like you, um, you know, credits due to, to Glenn Gaston and Brian Loeffler. Um, it's an intricate device and the 3D printing, I mean, it could essentially be integrated, but there's actually three components to that prosthetic. There's a surface EMG uh, that's being recorded. Uh, there's a driver component, uh, the motor, and then there's the finger, the digit component. Um, and uh, there was one company that was allowing it to be modified. It's not all made by the same company. And uh, lately there's been some intellectual property issues um, and they're not playing nice with each other. So it's kind of, that's, that's something that comes up as well. So um, the 3D printed fingers as well and, the, and even more like partial hands and full hands, um, durability is a big issue as well um, in terms of the plastic. So um, you could maybe swap out some things with the 3D but the partial hands that uh, Dr. Hagerberg was just showing, uh, they're, they're pretty complicated. And um, there's definitely a lot of componentry by a prosthetist and a lot of tweaking, uh, not only in the hardware, but also the software uh, that goes into it. Yeah, we've found that the EMG or bioprosthetics for partial hand are probably less useful for most of these patients because actually they can actually use their the remaining residual digits actually power a partial prosthetic much better than actually the EMG signal generator prosthetics that are out there. Now, once you go above the level of the wrist, there are a lot more options, but to your point, Dr. Um, uh, Jox and others, uh, you really need to get them in there early so they can actually utilize their cognition to actually pattern spatially recognize and pattern 
out there are different prosthetic functions. And that actually happens very early and very quickly. And when you do that, it allows for them to more rapidly adapt to it. The problem though, is finding prosthetists that can actually do these. And I have quite a few processes I work with, but there's only select ones that I work with that can actually do the very specialized EMG type pattern prosthetics. But I will say this, if you get a patient about prosthetic that has EMG signals at transradial, transhumoral, or even four quarter level, they will utilize their prosthetic more than three times more likely than someone that does not get that prosthetic. So they actually utilize their prosthetic more often. The problem is, as Dr. Stroll's point, they don't really have the um, durability and they tend to wear these machines and these servos out quite rapidly. So you have to replace them quite, quite a bit for them. Thank you, Dr. So, uh, I have uh, one question I want to ask uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Harvey Chin. Uh, my question, uh, actually, I have two questions. One question is, I, I was uh, enjoyed uh, with your talk about uh, you harvested the uh, um, LD FRAP in uh, supine prosthetics. As any uh, technique uh, details, uh, you can tell us. Uh, we because usually I harvest the uh, LD flavor, I, I use a, a decubitus position, not supine. I just think it's 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 hard to sterilize the skin before surgery. I don't know if uh, any uh, technique uh, or detail you can tell tell us. The other question is. Uh, you say you use the back dressing uh, in the uh, muscle flap. Um, it can help uh, the reduce uh, swelling of the muscle flap. Uh, I want to ask how do you monitor the, the viability of the muscle flap after surgery? Uh, the two questions. Um, so Dr. Xu, thank you for your questions. Um, so regarding the first question, um, I, I think that um, it, it takes a bit of uh, adjustment, but once you actually get to harvesting the latissimus from the supine position, it actually it's a lot easier because you see the pedicle a lot clearer. So you're actually looking at the, the pedicle from the side and it's very easy to dissect it as opposed to from the lateral decubitus position. And I don't even use a bump um, and people who do it, you know, you just make an incision along the side and you dissect straight down through the anterior border of the latissimus to the pedicle. And then you can actually harvest quite a strip of it. Um, and then if you need it to take more muscle, you can actually put a bump underneath the spine that's been described as the dorsal decubitus position centrally. And I've harvested the, the, the full latissimus uh, through the supine position. So it takes a bit of adjustment, but you know, we do it fairly often. And actually my residents have told me that they now enjoy doing it a lot more from the supine position. So it, it, it's because the pedicle is very easy to see. Um, and then um, the, regarding the second question about the implant, about the, the back dressing, we actually use implantable Doppler probe. So monitoring of the flap is entirely through the implantable Doppler. Uh, and that um, I, I found in, in my limited experience is actually pretty reliable. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 